So uh, thank you for joining and welcome to Lead Dev Bookmarked. Uh, Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things leadership, teams, tool, and tech. Bookmarked is our month monthly book club and this is our 12th event. Um, I'm Susan Bond and I'll be your moderator for this discussion. I'm a former COO of a scaling startup and a executive coach. My specialty is tech leaders. You can find me on Twitter at Susan Bond. Today we'll be talking with multi about multipliers with Liz Wiseman. Uh, Liz is a researcher and executive advisor who teaches leadership to executives around the world. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter, uh, The Multiplier Effect, Tapping the Genius Inside Our Schools, and Wall Street Journal's bestseller, Rookie Smarts, Why Learning Beats Knowing and the New Game of Work. She is the CEO of the Wiseman Group, a leadership research and development firm headquartered in Silicon Valley, California, as we've just been discussing. Um, some of her recent clients include Apple, AT&T, Disney, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Nike, Salesforce, Salesforce, Tesla, and Twitter. Liz has been listed on the Thinkers 50 ranking and in 2019 was recognized as the top leadership thinker in the world. Fantastic. Um, she has conducted significant research in the field of leadership and collective intelligence and writes for Harvard Business Review, Fortune, and a variety of other business and leadership journals. She's a frequent guest lecturer at BYU and Stanford University and is a former executive at Oracle Corporation, where she worked as the vice president of Oracle University and the global leader of human resource development. Welcome. Well, it's good to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you. I've been so excited about this. Uh, fun fact, I actually give this book to my leadership uh, coaching clients as one of in their care package as something said, this is about my philosophy and you know, this is where I'm coming from. So it's really exciting to have you. I'm just curious for those who, you know, just a little bit of background, how did the book Multipliers come about? Like what, you know, what was the genesis of it? <clears throat> well, you know, I, I say it in the book, but more and more, it's really true, is it was really my post-Oracle therapy. Mm. So, you know, I had <laughs> come out of 17 years at Oracle and I had, I had a lot on my mind and I had a few observations and I was trying to process that and make sense of it. And Oracle, I was there in the early years and in the really, really rapid growth years. And it was a very intense experience. And, you know, I never once had a job I was qualified for. And it really wasn't until like year 17, where I start to feel like I know what I'm doing, that work was no longer fun. And, and so I came out of that experience with a, few, a number of observations and a number of unanswered questions and time on my hands to, to process that. And and, you know, that's really the genesis of the book was this observation I had at Oracle about all of these smart people I worked around and hmm. not all of them got to be smart. And that's what was, I don't know, Susan, if I was cu curious or angry. In hindsight, oh, like yeah. In tell me more. That's so curious. <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, I'd like to think it was my research was fueled by pure intellectual curiosity. This question of like, why is it that some leaders seem to amplify the intelligence of people around them? And I, you know, I ended up calling them multipliers and why some leaders drain that. Like it actually, I think there was a little bit more anger behind it than anything else. And you know, I joined Oracle right out of graduate school. Oracle has been recruiting at the time, Oracle recruited at 17 universities. They were all elite universities. And I didn't go to one of those universities. Hmm. And, and, you know, I'm proud of where I went to school, but it wasn't one of these 17. So hmm. I come into the company and I guess I could have had this imposter syndrome, like, oh, do I really belong here? So they not only recruited out of these 17 elite universities, they recruited the top graduates out of the top engineering and CS programs out of the top schools. So these would be the top grads out of, you know, EE, CS, out of MIT and Caltech and Stanford and, you know, UC Berkeley and, you know, the list goes on. 
And I could have looked at this group and said, wow, I don't feel like I belong here. But I never felt that way. I, I did feel like I belonged. I just was enamored with all of these smart people that I worked with. I was just like, I can't, I can't believe I get to work with these people. They're all so bright, so capable. And, you know, most of them were like type A driven, driven, driven. Yep. But what made me mad was how much I admired all of these new college graduates and all the people who work there. But then I would watch some leaders seem to um, kind of like beat the intelligence out of them. And, you know, like, like the boss had to be the smartest person in the room. They would come in sort of like guns blazing with all of their insights and know-hows. They were know-it-alls. <laughs> and I would watch these really, really smart people that I felt fortunate to call my colleagues, like kind of stammer around them and mm. struggle to articulate themselves, hold back, play it safe. And I'm like, man, I know him to be really, really smart, but why was he not smart in that meeting? Mm -hmm. And then I would watch the very same person, you know, perform at his best in another meeting. And I just, I found it fascinating, but I was also a little bit ticked off by this because I'm like, well, why would you go, why would you work so hard to hire smart people and then underutilize them? Like that seems a, like a really dumb way to try to grow a company. And, and so it was really these observations that got me thinking. I love that. I love that you're like, curious slash angry because I know after I left senior leadership, you know, as a former COO, I had a lot of processing and a lot of I write from a lot of that experience too. And I think there's part of me that's a little curious and also a little angry. So I love that you say that because I'd never actually had that understood that about myself. That's that's great. And anger sometimes can fuel us in really powerful ways as it has. I mean this book has had a really big impact on your work in general. And I'm curious, can, for those who have not read the book or heard about your work, can you just give us a quick, how do you talk about multipliers? Like, how do you sort of define them? Just a quick, you know. Yeah, yeah. So multipliers, I define as leaders who use their own intelligence and capability in a way that amplifies or multiplies the intelligence of others. They're leaders who use the intelligence of others and their leaders around whom we tend to do our best work and we tend to do our best thinking. And um, they're leaders who really bring out the best in others, hmm. yeah. which may sound a little, I don't know, sweet or sugary. <laughs> but <laughs> in fact, when I finished the research for the book, I was um, writing an article with Harvard Business Review and I was felt very, very lucky to be able to write this article for Harvard Business Review and um, HBR titles the articles, uh, the authors don't get to title those. And they yep. sent me back this um, title and it was like bringing out the best in others. And I'm like, ew, that just sounds so soft and like, I was so disappointed and I was um, like, oh man, I'm gonna like tomorrow, I'm gonna like write a note and argue why we need like, this is about multiplying intelligence. And, and then I woke up and I realized, you know, that editor just named it perfectly. It's about a leader who brings out the very best in others. Um, so those are the multipliers and the diminishers. And my yep. guess is the name diminisher, everyone's like, oh yeah, I've worked for a bunch of these people. They are. They're smart and they're capable, but the problem with these leaders is other people don't get to be smart and capable around them. Like their intelligence, it might be prominent, but it's costly. Mm -hmm. Meaning other people seem to hold back around them. They play it safe. Maybe they're afraid to speak up because this person is like a micromanaging, know-it-all, yeller, screamer of a diminisher, but it could just be that they're so smart and so capable that they don't really need anyone mm -hmm. else and people defer to them. Well, like, oh, you know what? The boss will figure it out. She's just, she's always knows the right thing to do. I'll let her deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, she seems so like excited and hardworking. Yeah, I'll just let her handle this. And other people end up retreating a little bit of, around them. Mm. 
Well, yeah, and what struck me too is that I think we might think of like diminishers often as like tyrannical bullies and like you said, know-it-alls or narcissists, but sometimes good, pe good people, you know what I mean? Really well-meaning people might become like at what you call accidental dim dis diminishers. I'm yeah. curious like how that happens. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like what your thoughts are? <clears throat> well, that was, uh, that was one of the big surprises. So I guess the first big surprise in the research is that these diminishing leaders get less than half of people's available intelligence. Wow, and that's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. When I started the research, um, I could see this difference for sure. And I, I think I wrote down my hypothesis. It was like maybe, I, got th I thought the multiplier leaders got like 20% more. Like mm, mm. that is significant. It was a two X difference that these leaders are getting less than half. And even in parts of the world and in certain national cultures, that diminishing dynamic is deeper because of um, you know the hierarchy in the culture, the respect for elders and bosses and et cetera. So the second big finding was equally shocking as I was looking at this and all the examples, I thought, you know, there are a fair number of as you said, narcissistic, tyrannical, know-it-all, micromanaging bullies. But most of the diminishing that was happening was coming from what I called the accidental diminisher. And this is like, for me in the research, it was like a plot twist in a movie. So we've all been in a movie. I love that. <laughs> where, where you're watching the movie and then you have this like, uh, realization and you figure out that the good guys are the bad guys. And you're like, uh, oh, plot twist. I did not see this coming. And what I, I could see is that most of this diminishing, it's actually in the neighborhood of 60% of the diminishing that's happening in the workplace is coming from the nice guys, the, the well-meaning managers, the, the person who really likes being a manager. It's not doing it against their will. It wasn't like promoted against their will. They are right. like, no, I care about my people. I want to be a good manager. I sign up for management training. I read management books. I write management books. And <laughs> we find that this diminishing dynamic can be as deep, but it comes from the best of intentions. Leaders are being too, um, it's like, it's coming from leaders being too much of a good thing. Oh, can you say more about what do you mean by too much of a good thing? Too helpful. Mm. Like, so if a leader um, sees someone struggling in a project and they want to help, like, and their heart goes out to the person, they can very easily become the rescuer who ends yep. up saving the day, but kind of stealing the learning for themselves while the other person is left helpless, you know, and maybe even humiliated. Um, maybe they're too um, optimistic. They're mm. so, they're so convinced that like, we can do this, we can do hard things that they overlook that what people are doing is actually really hard. And, you know, and, and really they don't acknowledge the struggle. Um, Mm. Or maybe they're just too um, energetic. Mm. They become the always on leader. They bring so much energy that other people find it draining or they bring so much energy that other people hide from them. Like when they, mm. you know, when we see these leaders coming, we're like, ha, oh, don't make eye contact. You know, <laughs> like it's going to activate them. And so mm. like we avoid these leaders and you know, they might be too protective. Like, ooh, mm. let me keep you out of difficult conversations or difficult meetings. Like, you know what, this meeting is going to be contentious. Um, I'll handle it. Oh, this is getting political. Let me handle this. And yeah. And we see there's often this really big capability gap between these leaders and their team because they're rescuing them, they're protecting them, they're they're buffering them from the hardship. And like, where does the learning come? Yeah, I'm curious because it's so, yeah, it's, and I, I love this. And one thing I wanna like point out in particular about what you talked about, I hear a lot about people say, uh, you know, my job is to protect my team. And, and I always get a little like, oh. I'm so suspicious of this. Yeah, I'm like, I'm always like, ooh, 
you know, because like you said, there's learning in, in ad, you know, um, adversity and, and learning and growth that you learn when you're like, oops, I stepped in that one, you know, especially if you want to keep growing in your career. Is there ever a place, I'm curious, where someone can protect the team and be a multiplier? Is there a role for that in multiplying? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there are absolute places. And what's the, like, and what does it look like? You know what I mean? What's the difference between, let's say, a protecting diminisher versus a protecting multiplier? You know, I, the, the, the um, touchstone I always come back to in this work is intelligence. Like I, I was originally going to call the book intelligence multipliers because hmm. it's like what I fundamentally studied was not just what do great leaders do. What I looked at was what is it that leaders are doing that brings out people's intelligence, their know-how, their creativity, their insights, their <clears throat> technical skills, their business acumen. And so I always come back to what allows people to be intelligent. Hmm. Now, you know, if you're protecting people from politics, hmm. like maybe someone doesn't build that kind of organizational intelligence that they need. Like there's learning to be had there. However, if there's no learning to be had, like that might mm. be a place where you protect people or, you know, a wonderful way to protect your team is to protect their time. Like if people mm. can't get traction and make progress because they're, they're running around and they're scatterbrained, like saying, you know what, I'm going to protect you. I'll handle that meeting. Like, so you can go and, and work, like I'll deal with that. You code. Um, but we have to be really careful every time we get into the protective mode. Um, I'm, I'm a mom of four and mm -hmm. almost everything I do as a leader in, um, in my own work as an executive, my own work as like a founder, uh, owner of a research and development firm, my coaching work, almost everything I do, I sanity check it against what I've learned as a parent. Oh, I love that. And I find, well, I find that there's generally like a near 100% overlap between what, <laughs> I'm not saying managing in the workplace and parenting are the exact same thing. What I would say is the principles and mm. practices of the very best leaders look almost identical to those of the very best parents. And the very worst parents look a lot like the very worst hmm. corporate executives. Some people say, ooh, parenting and corporate leadership. And they think about bad parenting transferred into the workplace. But, you know, uh, when would I want to protect my kids? Like, I mostly would want to expose them. Now, if I know there is a toxic person who only would mean them harm, you know, I might say, you know what, let's not spend a lot of time with that person. Um, but for the most part, like my job as a parent has always been to, to expose my children to the world in a way that they can learn and be wise and intelligent and make good decisions when mom and dad aren't around. Mm -hmm. I love that as a rubric too, of like around like learning. You know, like what's the learning here? And is it a learning that's essential? I mean, maybe dealing with a toxic person, maybe there's some learning there, but the harm is pretty high. If you think about kids or even in the, and I think your mm -hmm. analogy is perfect, right? In corporate world, toxic people are tough. Yeah, and in some ways with just this idea of leaving like a multiplier, you know, whenever I don't have an answer that's come from my research is I always go back to, what would I do in this situation that would allow someone to have maximum intelligence? And it almost always steers me down the right path. So like, you know, skip the book and, and like that might be kind of like this fundamental criteria. Like how do you build intelligent, intelligent thought, intelligent decision-making, intelligent debate, intelligent insight, innovation? That's so good too. And I think it takes time. It's not, like what I'm hearing too, is it takes time for leaders, you know, to step back. I think people have to step back in order to kind of assess, you know what I mean? Rather than that gut instinct, like the person who always jumps in always takes care of things. Maybe it takes a minute to step back so that you aren't doing that accidental diminishing. Well, it is so much of our, um, 
Oh man, I see. I'm a researcher at heart, so I want like <laughs> want to do this like a frequency anal um, analysis on the <laughs> language we use. But the language we use around management and leadership is so active. It's like mm. step up, take charge. It's all this kind of like lean in, lean forward, go activate. And I think yep. most of the art form of modern leadership, meaning leadership in the agile, innovative, you know, um, collaborative kind of enterprise, a lot of that art form is about stepping back. It's about standing mm -hmm. down. It's about holding back, which for some of us is harder. Like mm -hmm. for some of us, it's harder to stay quiet than to speak up. Mm -hmm. you know, or even like, I, yeah, or letting go. I talk to a lot of leaders about letting go, you know, like, but I have to be active. I have to be involved and it can drive them into micromanagement, which I think might look like diminishing. Right. Yeah. I love oh, that. Like always diminishing. Like, it, <laughs> like it, it, someone has to have some really superb skills to micromanage and not have a diminishing effect. Like it takes yeah. real high order kind of communication skills to pull that off. Mm -hmm. Micromanaging was the number one word that came up over and over when we asked people to talk about their diminishing leaders. Oh, they were micromanagers. I, I can totally us, imagine. None of us like to be micromanaged. No, not even the people who do it. <laughs> I think no. they don't like it, but then they fall into it. And I don't think like my experience is sometimes they don't recognize it. They think they're, like you said, active. I'm getting the job done. I'm taking care of it. I'm moving the team forward or whatever. You know, I'm making sure I'm getting it done. But I think most leaders really, not only they resent micromanagers who micromanage them, most leaders who end up micromanaging, they resent having to do it. I, I don't know many people who enjoy it. Right. Because yep. it's always done grumbling. Right, oh, right, right. How to do this. Like, I think we know, like, deep inside of us, like, kind of based on the same principles of human nature upon which the Constitution of the United States was written. Like, and I'm sure the constitutions of many other countries as well, but like, this need for, like, self-determination and independence and agency, it is so deeply like ingrained in us. And so when bosses come along and try to usurp that, like we, we, we not just bristle at it, we like know on almost a moral level, this is wrong. Right. And when we end up doing it to others, we go, oh yeah, this is wrong. Or when somebody yep. is sloppy and pulls us into that micromanaging mode, we hate it. We hate what do you it. mean when someone's sloppy? You know, someone's not, you know, not doing their part of the work. So um, mm. let me put it this way. It wasn't too long after the book Multipliers came out that somebody said something that I thought was sort of just salty. He said, yeah, okay, I kind of get it. I think this might've been up at Salesforce. And he's like, yeah, get his head around it. I get it, I get it. I'm supposed to be a multiplier. He goes, yeah, but you can't multiply zero. Hmm. And I'm like, wow, I hope he's not implying that the people on his team are zeros. And I realized that wasn't what he it was implying. He was saying that you know there are certain kinds of mindsets and behaviors that the leader needs to bring but for really brilliant work to happen, there's also a set of mindsets and behaviors and practices that the contributors need to bring. Mm -hmm. And when we get sloppy as contributors, as talent, we end up pulling our leaders into a diminishing space. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see that actually. I'm working with a leader right now in, that does some of these things. It's really true. It's like that both sides of this. It's like the relationship, that relationship actually matters. You know, leaders absolutely need to bring it out of us, but you know, the rest of us need to bring it and, you know, move into our own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. So I'm curious about, um, you know, like obviously leaders have bosses too, right? Everybody has basically has a boss. And what do you do um, if you find yourself working for a diminisher, you know what I mean? Like, how do you handle that situation? Because sometimes you just do. I mean, we all have, we've all worked for a diminisher, right? Like I'm assuming your research probably showed something like 
if you looked at that. <laughs> well, I have had people come up to me who said, you know, Liz, it was like a secret. <laughs> I've never worked for one of these multiplier leaders that you talk about. I and they were like, secret. <laughs> well, they were, they were a little bit ashamed, like, oh. but, and also a little curious, like I've never had this kind of experience. Mm. It's almost like someone saying, I've never really been in a healthy relationship. <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of a, but I've never ever had someone say, I've never worked for a diminishing boss. Like, mm -hmm. I really believe we've all had experience, whether it's a workplace boss or a college professor or a teacher or yep. a voice coach or a little league coach. Like most of us know what this looks like. In fact, I think virtually all of us do. Okay, so if you find yourself working for with a diminishing leader, like, first of all, know that you are not alone in this, that most people are going to work and encountering a diminishing boss, particularly in organizations that are matrixed and complex where, you know, you don't just get one boss, you get a bunch and chances are there are gonna be some that have some diminishing qualities about them. That's number one. Um, you know, it's like, we're all kind of taking our turn working for some diminishing bosses. I've been on a mission for the last 10 years to like, eliminate diminishing, like rid the world of diminishing bosses. And love that. <laughs> unfortunately, I'm still working at this. Um, <laughs> yep. This is an ambition that um, Kim Scott and I very much share. She wrote Radical Candor and yep. we both, she kind of adopted the mission as well. Like, you know what, I'm with you, Liz, where we are ridding the world of bad bosses. Uh, we're going to be at this our whole lives trying to do this. Okay. Th that's number one. Number two, is know that most of the diminishing is accidental. We mm. often find ourselves working for diminishing bosses and we're like, oh, they have it out for me. And we tend to over identify yep. with it, over personalize it. Like, oh, they hate me. I have such a bad, no, no, no. They're, they probably, um, you know, there's a couple truisms I find in leadership. One is that when we have terrible bosses, we tend to personalize it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, people's bosses are thinking about them nearly as much as people think they are. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah, are, oh, my <laughs> boss is tormenting me. They're like doing this and then they're doing this. Like, no, actually your boss probably isn't thinking about you nearly as much because they've got like, they've got like 10, 12, 20 direct reports and you've kind of got one, maybe two or three bosses. Like, they're not thinking about you as much as, as you are. The other truism, like, um, I find that most bosses don't end up having a diminishing impact because, because they're um, power hungry. I find that it's more likely that they're gonna have a diminishing effect by being unaware of their power. Like, yeah, can we talk more about that? I think that's very true and people miss that. I, people always tell me, oh, they're all power hungry. And I'm like, no, I don't think they all are, but it, it doesn't mean they're all good just because they're not power hungry. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, uh, let's do that. And, and then I do want to come back to what do you do if you have yeah. a diminishing boss? Sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, it's important. So I, we'll, we'll bring um, our conversation back there. So here's a scene I see a lot. Um, is a senior executive says, well, you know, maybe we should do this, or we might want to consider that. And then like the higher they are in the organization, the more people scurry, okay, you know, the president said this, so therefore let's go and do that. And then two weeks later, the president looks at what happened is like, why'd we do that? Oh, well, you said so. Uh -huh. Like for them, a mere suggestion becomes like cardinal law. Yep. And we underestimate the power of our ideas. Um, like there was at one point where this was when I was at Oracle and I, was, I found that my enthusiasm for people's work was really sending people in a spin. People would come by my office proud that they had just um, accomplished something. Maybe we'd read, um, um, hit a milestone and they would pop their head and say, hey Liz, you know what, that program, we've got it off the ground. You know, we're doing this. We just ran our first pilot. We had great work and we're, and I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Like, have you thought about this? Or what about this? Or have you considered that? And then, you know, their eyes would get all big and then they'd leave my office. Like, what do I do with all of that? Mm. And I realized I was putting people in a, a spin because I'm a fountain of ideas. And mm. 
So at one point I have a, um, you know, my door of my office was like a shiny white surface worked as a whiteboard, it turned out. So I just wrote on the outside of my door, I wrote, ignore me as needed to get your job done. <laughs> I <love that. laughs> and I also put like, here are three top priorities, like just like, fine. I have a lot of ideas. Listen to me, humor me, but feel free to ignore me because what I'm trying to do is temper the power you have from your position. And I think there's a lot of times that, um, you know, people don't realize it. Again, parenting teaches us a lot about this. If you have teenagers, if you're listening to this and you have teenagers, you know exactly what this looks like. <laughs> you say one thing and they're like, oh, mom hates the way I dress or mom does this. <laughs> you're like, no, I was just commenting like, oh, that color looks nice on you. Well, you don't like red or, you know, it's you, re you forget that there are places where you have more power than you realize that yeah. you have and more power than you intended. And you, your words can spin people out. They can crush people. Yep. And yeah, it's funny. I was just writing this weekend. I'm writing a piece that's not quite there yet. It's all about like how we relate to authority figures and leaders and how there's just this automatic thing that happens for us. And I think as leaders, we have to recognize that people are gonna have responses to that. And we need to make sure we're being, wielding our power carefully, even if we don't think we're overstepping it. Yeah, know? and one little rule that I try to follow is, and it's certainly something I've used in coaching executives, is the more power you have, the more tentative you need to be in your own language. So good. Yeah, that's great. That's so good. Perhaps, you know, maybe is it possible that, because oh. otherwise your word gets taken as law. Yeah, it does. It's like edicts. One thing you might be wondering, I mean, I've, I've heard about, this happens all the time, honestly. And I love how you're tying it to the diminisher. So can we, let's go back. Cause I, I diverted you back to, you had one more thing, I think at least on the working for a diminishing boss, like one more thing you should do. Well, um, there's a bunch of things you should do, but I'm going to like <laughs> try to sum this up with um, someone just mentioned to me the other day, that episode of Seinfeld where George Castagna decides mm -hmm. his best work strategy is to do the exact opposite of what he thinks he should do. Do you know this episode? Mm-hmm. And it turns out it just works out great for him. <laughs> it's one where we should do the opposite of what our intuition often tells us to do. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have a micromanaging, controlling, know-it-all kind of boss. Like our natural reaction is to push that person away. Well, we tend to judge them as kind of wrong. Like, like I said before, kind of on a moral level, we tend to decide they don't deserve to be in our space, our work. We tend to ignore them, push them away, keep them out, protect our team from the diminisher down the street, so to speak. And it actually makes the problem much worse. So mm -hmm. I did a study, looked at like how 200 people were dealing with really severe diminishing bosses. And what I found is of like the five most prevalent ways that we respond to diminishers, four of the five of those absolutely exacerbate the problem. Hmm. So like, what do we tend to do with a know-it-all boss? Well, we tend to argue with them. Like, what do you, what happens when you argue with a know-it-all? <laughs> um, or if you've got a micromanaging boss and you try to keep her out of the details, what happens when you try to keep a micromanaging, controlling kind of boss away? Then they want to see everything. And, and so mm -hmm. instead of pushing them out, what I found works best is to just pull them in. And what we usually have to do is start by just dialing down the volume, meaning dialing down the importance of this voice in our life. Like, you know what? My mm -hmm. boss is probably not doing this on purpose. She's got a lot of other people that she's worried about. She's probably doing this more out of ne neglect than intent. You know what? This is not the only boss I'll have in my whole life. This is not the only person whose view of my work matters. And just to like turn that volume down, yeah. not to ignore them. And then the best strategy for dealing with that diminisher is either kind of just do the opposite of what you think or 
decide to be the multiplier, which is really the opposite. Because when someone diminishes us, we tend to want to diminish back. Right, right, right. And instead- It almost gets like this like battle, right? It almost gets like a control battle. When people get into a control battle with their boss, I'm always like- you're going to lose. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, Ooh, I know I understand your instinct, but you know, no. And, um, you know, like, uh, 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 one woman who worked for Steve jobs, she would say that like when she would get into a meeting with Steve and it was clear he was opinionated and he had made up his mind. She said, I never would argue with him at that point. What I would do is I would say, Steve, you've given me really interesting things to think about. Would it be okay if I go away and think about some of the things you suggested and come back to you next week, I call this retreat and regroup. And she said, every time I'd go back and I never was like, okay, Steve, we'll just do what you say. It was like, I would take my thinking and then I would take his thinking and I would come back and and kind of re-argue my case. And he was always supportive. Or Ron Johnson, who worked for Steve, who understood Steve's just what I call his native genius, just what Steve did brilliantly. And so when Ron, who ran the retail part of Apple, would go in to present to Steve, he would say, okay, like here's our our plan for a new flagship store. And he would present the work and then he would ask Steve a single question. I thought it was so brilliant. See, he really understood what Steve was brilliant at. And he, he knew that Steve made things better. Like that was the brilliance of Steve Jobs. He would take kind of crappy technology and turn it into brilliant technology. And he would go in to Steve and he would say, okay, here's our best thinking on this, da, 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 da. Steve, what can we do to make it better? Mm. Oh, well, we could do this and we could change this here and do this. And so Ron would walk out having collaborated with Steve with great work made even better with Steve totally on board because Ron was mature enough to not say, well, Steve really should be using my native genius and he should be entirely entrusting these decisions to me. He was like, no, I'm gonna be not only a multiplier to my my team, I'm gonna be a multiplier to my boss. Like when we give the people Mm -hmm. above us a chance to be at their best, Mm -hmm. they wanna collaborate with us. Mm -hmm. I once had, um, there was an executive at Oracle I worked with really closely. And I remember one thing he said to me, this is way before I had done this research. Um, he, he said, I, I like working with you because I always feel like I'm at my best. Mm. And, and he was way more senior than me, you know, you kind of ran the company and like multiply up. And it's just so hard for us to do because we want to respond to diminishing with diminishing. And there's a, there's a quote that my guess is so many, maybe everyone has heard, but I want to maybe share it in this context. I probably won't get it. it, (laughs) I won't get it right, but maybe Susan, you can help me on this is um, it was something Martin Luther King said, and he was describing the problem with responding to violence with violence. Mm. And he said, um, let's see if I can get it right. Um, Like the problem with violence is it is a descending spiral begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of Mm -hmm. diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Um, Mm. Like responding to violence with violence adds like a deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Mm. And then he says, darkness cannot drive out (laughs) darkness. Only light can do that. And I think we try to drive out diminishing with darkness. Yeah, it's like almost like, what are you multiplying it? Like when you try to do that, you're multiplying darkness instead of lightness or empowerment or what, you know, or being better or whatever word you might want to put to it. Yeah. So it's like, we have to decide. There's a whole set of strategies. There's a chapter in the book in the second edition called dealing with diminishers. There's like 13 strategies. Some I call, um, defenses against the dark arts of diminishing leadership (laughs) for the Harry Potter fans. But, you know, the basic message of the chapter is like, be a multiplier up. You won't change that person into a multiplier. Certainly not in the short run, but it will change the relationship because you will have built trust. And the very kind of things that happen when you're a multiplier to your team, 
people are drawn to want to work with you. They feel trusted. They want to collaborate with you. And they, they might, um, it'll give you the space you need to work. It'll change the, your relationship with that person. I love that. I also feel like maybe there's a little bit of that too, which maybe mitigates the harm a little bit. You might not turn them into a multiplier, but they won't be able to, like their tendencies may not cause as much harm for you um, and on top of the relationship. Yeah, and you know, I guess sort of even a precursor to, you know, be the multiplier in that relationship. Sometimes you just have to stand up for yourself. And um, yep. for me, this is an art form I learned at a very young age. I had a kind <laughs> of a, a know-it-all bossy father and boy, as a little girl, I learned that, <laughs> you know, really what kind of a bully respects is someone who stands up for themselves. It's like, no, that's not okay. Like, and I went into the workforce very much like this. I remember the first time someone tried to take credit for my work. I was like, you know, this is my boss. I'm like, let's sit down and go through this. Like, whose idea was it? And, you know, who did the work on this? Okay. And then I, I just talked her through it. And she's like, you're right, Liz, like you should present this work. And there are so many times where I have like just had to just assert like, no, you know what, you don't need to rescue me. I got this. Or, you know what, like, no, I was speaking, let me finish. And there's a lot of power in just, a, you know, not being aggressive, but just standing up for yourself. Yeah, it sounds like too, like finding that balance between you don't want to get into the, like I talk about like control battles or diminishing behaviors, but you also don't want to lay down. Absolutely. And the story like with Steve Jobs and how people respond to him, you, you want to also advocate for yourself because when you advocate for yourself, you also advocate for the rest of the people on your team. Mm -hmm. And the way to, to do this really well, I think if I were coaching someone in this space is to not assert yourself mm -hmm. as much as assert your capability. Mm. When we assert ourselves, it's like me, me, I want to speak. It's like, mm -hmm. I can do this. And my favorite, um, like what I try to channel, and I would encourage you if you need to do this is to channel a three-year-old. Now, some of you <sighs> have had a three-year-old. Some of you know, like, or maybe an aunt or an uncle to a three-year-old, maybe some of you are grandparents to a three-year-old, mm. but like, think about what happens when you try to do for a three-year-old, what the three-year-old can do for themselves. And I've asked a lot of people this question, like what happens when you say to your three-year-old daughter, like here, or you try to put the coat on your daughter when she can do it herself or carry the packages that your son thinks he can carry. It's a very universal reaction all around the world. What they do is they say, I do it. I do it, daddy. Um, a, a one woman on my team, her, she said her three-year-old daughter just says, I, like I do. <laughs> and it's like, no mommy, I do this. I carry my plate, I do it. And they don't, what they're telling you is I, I have the capability to do this, let me do it. And they don't sit you down and have like a conversation <laughs> with you, what a bad parent you are and like that you're diminishing them and they're offended by this. And they, really <laughs> back off. they just say, I do this, I do it. And that's what we often need to say to diminishing leaders is I can do this. Like, I know you're concerned. I know you wanna help, I got this. Mm. And then you better got it. Yeah, then, yeah. Then you better got it. I think it's great too for like those accidental again, like thinking about the people who accidentally are diminishing, particularly around like protecting or I want to take care of you and you know all of that. Um, Liz, I can't. This has been so fun. I I want to ask you if it's okay. I know you've had your head in a manuscript. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about um, or a lot bit about what you're working on. Well, I am working on, uh, the book is called Impact Players. We've just named it recently. And it's about what the most impactful players are doing in the workplace. So, um, you know, the impact player is someone who like brings a lot of capability, but they also seem to like raise the confidence and capability of a team. And um, what I've been looking at is what are they doing that makes them so extraordinarily influential, extraordinarily valuable, extraordinarily impactful. It's like the people at work who have a huge impact and we, we tend to know who these people are. 
and they tend to be entrusted with the biggest assignments, the biggest responsibilities. They tend to have a lot of influence in organizations. And I've been studying them and trying to like decode this, looking at what are the, how do they think differently than other people? And what do they do differently? And what's causing this huge impact? And, you know, I coming from a belief that um, it's a way that we can all work to increase our influence and, you know, and do work that is more impactful, but also more meaningful. Yeah, I love that because I think sometimes we think, oh, well, they're just more talented than me or they have more of these things rather than like maybe all of us. I don't know. I don't know any about your research, but maybe all of us. How can all of us learn from those impact players and have more impact and take some of those, those Absolutely. qualities? And one of the fun things I did in the research is I controlled for intelligence and capability. And what I said, like I asked managers to, we interviewed 170 managers and the managers, you know, talked about someone who was very typical, someone who was extraordinarily impactful and valuable, and then someone who was under contributing, working below their capability. The, the criteria was that each one of those three people had to be someone who was smart and capable. So mm -hmm. like, no dummies allowed in this research pool. It was everyone is smart and capable. Why is it that some people, they, they seem to play their intelligence and talent differently than others. So it's not wow. about being smart or talented. Right. It's about how you work. Oh my God, I cannot wait to read this. When is the when is the book out? Like, is it 2022, 2023? No, uh, it should be October 21. And I'm- Oh, like, yay, I can't wait to read it. You know what, my manuscript is due in two weeks. So I'm like- mm. <laughs> We so appreciate you being here today. Um, thank you so much for joining us for uh, during this session. Uh, our next session will be on April 6th. We'll be talking um, with Annie uh, Jean-Baptiste on Building for Everyone. And on May 4th, we'll be talking with Heminia Ibarra about Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. Thanks so much, everybody.